prophet Isaiah, our ancient word of the morning, speaks of this God as that is so high and so low. The prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61. The Lord's spirit is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release for the captives and liberation for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication for our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for Zion's mourners, to give them a crown in place of ashes, oil of joy in the place of mourning, a mantle of praise in the place of discouragement. They will be called oaks of righteousness, planted by the Lord to glorify himself. They will build the ancient ruins. They will restore formerly deserted places. They will renew ruined cities, places deserted in generations past. Thanks be to God for this word from of old. And now a more contemporary word. A modern word from a speech by the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright in 2008. The speech was at the National Press Club. I call our faith tradition. However, the prophetic tradition of the black church because I take its origins back past Jim Crow, past the sermons and the songs of the Africans in bondage. And in the traditional slave trade, I take it back past the problems of Western ideology and notions of white supremacy. I take and I trace the theology of the black church back to the prophets in the Hebrew Bible and to the last prophet in, any, in my tradition, the one we call Jesus of Nazareth. The prophetic tradition of the black church has its roots in Isaiah, the 61st chapter, where God says, the prophet is to preach to the gospel to the poor and to set at liberty those who are held captive. Liberating the captives also liberates those who are holding them captive. It frees the captives and it frees the captors. It frees the oppressed and it frees the oppressors. The prophetic theology of the black church during the days of chattel slavery was a theology of liberation. It was preached to set free those who were held in bondage, spiritually, psychologically, and sometimes physically. And it was practiced to set the slaveholder free from the notions that they could define other human beings or confine a soul set free by the power of the gospel. The prophetic theology of the black church during the days of segregation Jim Crow, lynching, and the separate but equal fantasy was a theology of liberation. It was preached to set African Americans free from the notion of second class citizenship, which was the law of the land and was practiced to set free misguided and miseducated Americans from the notion that they were actually superior to other Americans based on the color of their skin. The prophetic theology of the black church in our day is preached to set African Americans and all other Americans free from the misconceived notion that different means deficient. Being different does not mean one is deficient. It simply means one is different. Snowflakes, like the diversity of God loves. Black music is different from 
European and European American music. It is not efficient, it's just different. Black worship is different from European and European worships. It is not deficient, it's just different. Black preaching is different from European and European American preaching. It is not deficient, it's just different. It is not bombastic, it's not controversial, it's just different. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for interpreting for us in recent weeks the words of Dr. King, the words of Reverend Dr. Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. And this morning, the words of Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright. Let's pray together. For the prophets of old and the prophets of now, for their courage to speak a strong word, a challenging word, a needed word, for their vision in helping us see where God is at work in the world and even in our lives. Amen. So good morning to all. It's good to join with you this fourth Sunday of African American History Month 2021. Thank you to all under the leadership of Pastor Carolyn who have worked to plan this month. It has been a rich, rich experience as we've again tried to include all the pieces, find the missing pieces of our history. Two weeks ago, I spoke with you of a misunderstood minister, the Reverend Dr. Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Congressperson from New York City and longtime pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church. Dr. Powell encouraged us to ask what's in our hands and find strength and courage and direction and value. This morning I would like to speak to you of another misunderstood minister, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, born in 1942 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Wright went to college at Howard University after serving in the United States Marine Corps. Got a divinity group degree from Chicago Theological Seminary and a subsequent doctor's degree from United Theological Seminary. In 1972, he became pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, a, a struggling congregation. Many thought he had been sent there to give Trinity a funeral, but Dr. Wright, Dr. Wright teaching and believing that Jesus did not officiate at burials but instead participated in resurrections. Dr. Wright helped bring that church to new life. Perhaps he's best known as the one-time pastor of President Barack Obama. And when then Senator Obama was running for the presidency, some of the controversial remarks he made difficult sermons he delivered. And perhaps unfairly, then candidate Obama had to 
distance himself from his pastor, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright. You see, there were folks who attacked Dr. Wright, not understanding, not understanding the point of view of the historically black church, not understanding the point of view of black liberation theology, not understanding the prophetic tradition of the Bible. I mean, Jeremiah Wright, Jeremiah, a powerful prophet, the weeping prophet, Jeremiah Wright simply lived up to his name. Oh, the, his antagonist, his detractors found all kinds of clips from his sermons. And in fact, President Obama in his recent memoir himself said, you know, sometimes even I found Dr. Wright's sermons a little over the top, but maybe we need to always keep in context where he was coming from and the immense, immense good he was doing for so many, he did for so many in the city of Chicago. The video clip that played again and again and again was a clip in which Dr. Wright said, God bless America, no! God, D-A-M-N, America. People were aghast. Of course, Dr. Wright was making the point that America demanded of many that we pledge allegiance to the flag when that flag and those who purported to represent it, represent it had absolutely no allegiance to those who offered the pledge. Dr. Wright acknowledged that he was profoundly influenced by the theology of James Cone, a black liberation theology. And Cone essentially said, where do we find God? Not among the powerful, but among the suffering. And so often, the people of color in our country are the suffering. That's where God is, in fact, in many ways. God is black. God is brown. God is yellow. For God suffers. The viewpoint of liberation theology, and Wright wanted to make sure that Yes, he accepted and respected this position, but he wanted to be identified more as in the vein of prophetic biblical theology. He writes, in the late 60s, when Dr. James Cone's powerful books burst onto the scene, the term black liberation theology began to be used. And I do not in any way disagree with Dr. Cone, nor do I in any way diminish the inimitable and incomparable contributions that he has made and he continues to make. This was written some years ago, Dr. Cohn passed away, what, three years ago now? But he said, however, I call our faith tradition the prophetic tradition of the black church because I take its origins back past the theologian James Cohn past the sermons and songs of Africans in bondage in the transatlantic slave trade. I take it back past the problem of Western ideology and notions of white supremacy. I take and trace the theology of the black church back to the prophets of the Hebrew Bible and to its last prophet in my tradition, the one we call Jesus of Nazareth. The prophetic tradition of the black church has its roots in Isaiah, the scripture we read this morning. Isaiah, the 61st chapter, where God says the prophet is to preach the gospel to the poor and to set at liberty those who are held captive. Liberating the captives also liberates those who are holding them captive. Dr. Wright would be identified with the prophetic tradition, 
the tradition that calls forth in the name of a God that is not too high and not too low, a God of transformation, a God that is always and forever working to make all things new. The prophetic tradition, the honest tradition, the transformative tradition, but the prophetic tradition that Dr. Wright represented, honored, if there was transformation, that transformation always started with honesty, an honest description of the captivity, of the suffering, of the pain, of the despair. It didn't gloss these over. It named them and said that in the midst of these, in the midst of captivity, real captivity, God is working to set the captives free. In the midst of blindness, real blindness, God is working to bring sight to the blind. In the midst of real grief, God is working to bring comfort, transformation. But it always starts with naming the pain. And that's where Dr. Wright, so many found Dr. Wright and still find him so difficult because he named the pain. He named the pain on the way to proclaiming transformation. He named the pain in the, on the way to promising resurrection. But some, so many struggled with his honest description of the pain. But if we are to move to transfer, transformation with the prophets, with Jesus, with Dr. Wright, we, we need to name the pain. It was 1960. Reading now from John Meacham's His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope. It was 1960 and John F. Kennedy had signaled his sympathy for the civil rights cause in the closing weeks of that year's presidential campaign. On Sunday, October 16th, 1960, Martin Luther King Jr. had been arrested during a sit-in at Rich's department store in Atlanta. He was attempting to desegregate the store's Magnolia Room restaurant and he was sentenced to four months of hard labor at Georgia's Reedsville Penitentiary. Coretta King, who was six months pregnant, was terrified that their, her husband might not come out of prison alive. They're gonna kill him, Mrs. King told Harris Wolford, a Notre Dame law professor and Kennedy advisor. I know they're going to kill him. Wolford reached out to Kennedy brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, with an idea. Would JFK call Mrs. King to express his concern? Shriver called the candidate who was in Chicago, and King called Mrs. King. I know this must be very hard for you, Kennedy told her. I understand you're expecting a baby. I just want you to know that I was thinking about you and Dr. King and JFK's brother went to work to get the prison sentence changed. The maneuvers paid off politically. Martin Luther King Sr., Dr. King's father, known as Daddy King, had endorsed Richard Nixon. The elder King said he couldn't support a Roman Catholic. But after that phone call, he reversed course because this man, John F. Kennedy, was willing to wipe the tears from my daughter-in-law's eyes, acknowledge the pain, name the pain. Daddy King said, I've got a suitcase of votes and I'm going to take them to Mr. Kennedy and dump them in his lap. In such a close run election, it's possible that 
Kennedy's intervention was crucial to the outcome. The power of naming the pain, transformation, resurrection, have seeds in naming, acknowledging, accepting the pain and saying that God is there, always there, but not stopping there. Another story from Lewis's biography by Meacham. On Sunday, March 7th, this is 1965, a long line of marchers gathered at Brown Chapel AME Church in Selma. King was back in Atlanta for Sunday service. Lewis and Hosea Williams led the column of demonstrators ambulances. Demonstrators ambulances brought up the rear. Volunteer doctors and nurses had already set up a field medical unit next to the church. Ready to be arrested, Lewis carried two books, an apple and an orange, and a toothbrush and toothpaste in his backpack. One of the books was Columbia University historian Richard Hofstetter's The American Political Tradition, which included this quotation from the abolitionist Wendell Phillips. I must educate, arouse, and mature a public opinion. This I do frankly and candidly, criticizing its present policy. It names the pain. My criticism is not like that of the traitor presses meant to paralyze the administration, but to goad it to more activity and vigor. vigor. That was Lewis's mission. Dr. Jeremiah Wright, one who lived up to his name, the prophet Jeremiah, naming the pain and pointing to transformation helping others experience that transformation. I heard Condoleezza Rice speak a few weeks ago. She spoke about many things, but talking about history, she said, you know, I think most of us, those of us from a more conservative place, a more progressive place, we make a mistake. We try to, and this is her word, here's your Pastor Jim big word for the day. We try to decomplexify history. And we make a mistake in doing so. I'm not here this morning to decomplexify Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, or many of the misunderstood ministers, of the African-American tradition. I am saying we do well to understand the prophetic tradition in which many of them stand. Theologian Walter Brueggemann says this, the prophetic tasks of the church are to tell the truth in a society that lives in illusion, to grieve in a society that practices denial, and express hope in a society that lives in despair. Let me say that again. Walter Brueggemann. The prophetic task of the church are to tell the truth in a society that lives in illusion, Grieve in a society that practices denial and express hope in a society that lives in despair. We need to give thanks for the Adam Clayton Powell Juniors of the world, for the Dr. Jeremiah Wrights of the world and for the prophetic tradition in which they stand, telling the truth, the hard truth, and helping us to see the ways that even in the midst of the despair, 
God is at work to save and to bless. We can't understand Dr. Wright, Dr. Powell, without understanding that their powerful preaching and their work for justice is grounded, 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 always in prayer. Conversations with God, two centuries of prayer by African Americans and altar prayer. Jeremiah Wright, if we are to understand Dr. Wright and appreciate his power, we must understand he was rooted always in prayer. With every heart, he prayed, with every heart turned toward God, we come, Lord. First of all, just to thank you this morning, to thank you for all your blessings. We come to thank you for the opportunity of having some kneeling space in order to have a time alone with you. We thank you for the joy and privilege of being your children in this house of worship, this Zoom screen of worship even now. Lord, thou hast searched us and known us. We cannot come before you with any pretense this morning. We come open, indeed naked, before the one who knows all about us. And as we sit or kneel, we realize that you see us, warts and all. Oh, we're covered up with Sunday go-to-meeting clothes and makeup and jewelry, but we realize that before you, all the scars, all the pain of who we are is made evident before thine eyes. We thank you for not treating us like we've treated you, Lord. We thank you for watching over us this past week. We thank you for being a doctor in the sick room. We thank you for opening up a way to provide a job for someone who did not know how they were going to feed their family. Lord, we thank you for watching over us last night. We thank you for the food we eat and the clothes on our backs. We thank you for the loved ones and for family. And we thank you most of all this morning for Jesus, the one who helps us hold on when we don't feel like it the one who helps us keep on knowing that we are not moving all by ourselves. The Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, a misunderstood minister who named the point, named the pain, in some ways lived the pain but pointed always, always beyond the pain, beyond himself to the God who shows up where we're hurting most, who shows up when we need God most and leads us to transformation, to hope, to healing, to vision, to courage, and to promise. Oh, we are the better. We are the better for misunderstood ministers present. Dr. Powell, Dr. Wright, misunderstood prophets from long ago, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jesus. We can be grateful that in our scriptures and in our history, we have a record of the prophetic tradition in which they stand, honest, hard, hopeful. Amen.